from a, a novel I'm writing, and I don't think I really need to tell you anything about it. The narrator's name is Piper, and this is the first date. The back of Sustainable Living Grocery Mart is less attractive than the front. No mural of colorful vegetables dances over the loading dock. Instead, there's a large blue dumpster and some kind of compost bin, and the combined smell reminds me of the homeless in South Central, except less acrid because alcohol-infused sweat is missing from the confection. Ayla sits on the edge of the concrete bay, her green apron removed to reveal blue jeans and a black t-shirt. Her van-covered feet swing, hitting the low side of the wall, and thick, dark hair tumbles into her eyes. She hops down when she sees me. Let's just walk to Overland Cafe, she says as a greeting. It's close and the food's good. You won't find any parking over there. That's fine. I'm so nervous the roots of my hair are tingling. As we begin walking, Ayla shoves her hands in her pockets and keeps her gaze just ahead of her, occasionally darting her eyes to the cars and the pedestrians. Overland Avenue is the busiest street in this part of Culver City, and its six lanes are taken up with honking drivers all trying to get somewhere on their lunch break. We pass a small bakery, and the fresh bread smell soothes the tight expression on my face. I start to breathe more deeply. I've got an hour, Ayla says. Okay. I'm not going to ask her about her job or if she's always lived in Los Angeles. I will think of something else to ask her. My hands are shoved into my pockets, too. I chose my best pair of jeans and a form-fitting orange tank top and topped off with white flip-flops, silver earrings, and lip gloss. My straightened hair is pulled back into a ponytail at the moment. It's actually cooperating. We arrive at Overland Cafe, which has plenty of windows, and the flooding sunlight gives its oak floors and tables a healthy glow. I feel a strange satisfaction when the hostess says, two, before reaching for a couple of menus. She seats us near a window in the main space, and once in my chair, I focus on my meal decision like it's the most important one I'll ever make because I can't think of what to say to the person across from me. You know, you don't look gay, Ayla says after a few minutes have gone by. She folds her menu, tosses it on the table, and interlaces her fingers in front of her, a friendly smile stretching across her face. But I could tell you were. I must have been holding my breath, because when I try to respond, there's no air to move words. Lifting one knee at a time, I release the trapped hands I've been sitting on. How's that? You hook your keys on your belt, with, on your belt loop with a carabiner. It's pretty gay. Oh, I can hear you coming over to me from the tea aisle. <laughs> Did you know I was going to ask you out? Oh, is this a date? She peers out at me from under those impossible bangs. How did you know I was gay? I suck on my teeth while I contemplate this. She grins when she sees my squint. Only kidding. Everyone knows. It's flippin' obvious. <laughs> the waitress arrives. I pick the chicken sandwich with a cup of tomato soup, and Ayla asks for a hummus wrap. As she looks up to order, I can see her jugular vein running along the right side of her neck from her jawline to the jut of the collarbone poking out above her black t-shirt. It is a thing of beauty, this vein, a blue tendril like a tree root. Where'd you go? Ayla asks, turning back to me. I mumble something about good veins and dive into my water glass. <laughs> How long have you been working at Sustainable Living? She nods as if expecting this. On and off for about a year, but I work a lot of jobs. Before I can ask what that means, she says, what about you, Piper? Ambulance, I answer. I mean, I'm an EMT on an ambulance. Emergency medical technician, she says, sure. How do you like doing that? I love it. I kind of suck at it, but I love it. She's amused. You suck at it? If I suck at my job, things don't get arranged right. If you suck at your job, I'm new, I say, smiling. Only two days in. Ah, well, no wonder. Have they played any pranks on you yet? No, but they don't really have to. She cocks her head to one side, interested. I find myself telling Ayla about snapping the elastic of a pediatric oxygen mask I heroically managed to place on a 300-pound man, putting gloves on backwards and the wrong size, and filling out my birth date instead of the patient's on paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> the reward for my self-deprecation is the way her mercurial green eyes lock on my face as I spin one story after another, and the sound <laughs> of her rich laughter in all the hoped-for moments. Sounds about right, she says when I stop to catch my breath. You're lucky, in the military you would have earned some awful nickname by now. The waitress arrives and we lean back as our plates are placed in front of us. On mine, a lemon grilled chicken breast nestles in with pesto and arugula. The military? Her fingers hover over an enormous hummus wrap as if deciding how best to capture it. 
In the end, she saws it in half, ignores her fork, and takes a bite out of one triangulated edge. Swallowing, she says, one guy I knew was obsessed with adding hillbilly armor to the piece of shit Humvees we had. Plywood, chunks of 2x4, sandbags, scrap metal, anything you could find. Sometimes you just sit and tack welds onto it as if the extra cauterization would help. She snorts. He would have pulled into a scrapyard in the middle of a mission if we'd let him. Taken aback by this new information, I ask the first question that comes to mind. What was his nickname? We called him the A-Team. For the time he did something incredibly stupid, but fortunately it worked out really well. Her brow furrows. I can't remember what it was. I run my tongue over my teeth to sweep for bits of arugula, and she continues, telling me between swallows that she was in the army for about two years before getting discharged for injury. It was bad when I first got back, she says. I had nightmares all the time. I used to choke my partner in my sleep. She picks up the second half of her wrap, stares into the face of it, places it back down. I picture her finding out in the morning the things she had done to her lover during the night. And now? She shrugs. I got discharged in 2004, so what, almost six years? She crosses her arms in front of her, both elbows resting on the table. It's not gone, but it's better. What TBI, she says. Traumatic brain injury. Her expression has shifted. What was warm is now wary, and her eyes are flat. She could be talking about a book or a TV show. I remember how in the months following my last breakup, I would casually tell people I barely knew about how my ex had been fucking my friend behind my back. As if I could make it a small and unimportant thing that way. But there's also something I can't quite place, a challenge. It's as if Ayla was saying, if you think you're interested in me, you need to know these things, and then maybe think again. I hold her gaze, my curiosity dimming behind a surge of empathy. We stare at each other for what feels like several minutes. Her eyes are green gold streaks flecked with amber, a mix of wistfulness and resolve. Until she pre breaks the eye contact and shifts in her seat. The table stretches longer between us. Finally, I say, glad you're here and not there, Ayla. She laughs, looks out the window, laughs again and shakes her head. Me too. Thank you.